One of the biggest challenges and ironies of character collecting RPGs are that players often simply stick with the team they have. Once you've poured hours into building and buffing your squad, it's tempting to use it for everything rather than collect and evolve new characters. But when a game's core revolves around adapting to new challenges and enemies, developers need to encourage players to branch out. The thing with AFK Arena is that uh, kind of meta in, in the, which characters you use, it kind of shifts the more you play. That's Timu, one of the analysts at Game Refinery who's an expert in all things AFK Arena. And it's true that while players starting out will focus on characters like Brutus and Shamira, by the time you reach a certain level in mid-game, other heroes really come into their own. Developer Lilith Games has balanced the game so that your initial squad deliberately becomes less useful, and this waxing and waning of character ability continues throughout the game. Being a great long-term AFK Arena player requires you to be responsive and know when to shuffle your team. In other words, diversity is a core tenet of AFK Arena's game design. And this rule doesn't just apply to character rosters. A constant flow of events, daily tasks, updates and ideas keeps variation at the fore. With over 10 million downloads, AFK Arena is a force to be reckoned with. And in this episode of Game Dev Playbook, we're breaking down why. Let's take a quick moment to recap how AFK Arena plays. It's a turn-based card RPG, so the core gameplay loop is battling to receive rewards that you then use to upgrade your team. It's the same motivation as pretty much every gacha-driven game on the market, but where AFK Arena breaks the mold is by leaning into the idle or AFK element. There's a bit less of this than the trailer suggests. When you switch off the app, a small chest in the main menu accumulates useful items that make battles easier, and in a nifty twist, the chest becomes full every 12 hours. This encourages players to play two long sessions in a day. For example, one at 8 a.m. when they wake up and then another one at 8 p.m. after dinner. Battles themselves are automated and fast paced. Characters attack of their own accord with the player only choosing when to trigger a special attack. The strategy revolves entirely around who you bring to battle, meaning this is a great game for those who enjoy the collection aspects of RPGs over strategic decision making. And apparently, that's a lot of people. This is the highest, probably most rated mobile game I have ever seen. Almost 2.3 million reviews so far. Holy, man, that is actually ridiculous. Which brings us to talking about progression. Games like AFK Arena live and die on how smart they make a player feel. Developers must pepper enough meaty challenges to test metal without making players lose momentum. In other words, progress should be as obvious and steady rolling as that boulder in Raiders of the Lost Ark. One of the ways AFK Arena manages this is through the campaign map that you see right when you log in. You can't replay levels. It's not a farming mode. This is a progression benchmark. The core loop here is smart. Levels ratchet up in difficulty and spike at boss levels, which creates stoppage points where you're forced to hone your team of five heroes. These points become the milestone markers of AFK Arena and sets the pace. Hit a block, and this is where monetization comes in. One of the biggest innovations in AFK Arena is the fact that none of the game's initial offers to new players help them progress instantly. Many games of this type will dangle an in-app purchase that catapults a newbie into a more advanced game mode. Instead, AFK Arena's monetization centers on progression blocking. If you're stuck on a level, you can spend money on resources to upgrade or summon new heroes. Both of these things make you stronger, but they don't guarantee you'll make it through to the next level, which intensifies a player's sense of their own skill. This is where the gacha system comes in. Being stuck on a level blocks progression, but hitting a hero level cap is also sure to slam on the brakes. This forms the spine of AFK's central monetization drive. To ascend a hero and make them stronger, you'll need three identical heroes, which you'll get from pulling a lot of gachas. This is time intensive if you don't make a purchase, and as you progress through the game, the need to pull gachas mounts, along with the temptation to spend. Then there's the AFK aspect of AFK Arena. Even if you didn't play the game for 15 days, you'd come back and rewards would have been accumulating. Your recently used team will automatically fight an endless mob of enemies while you're away, which farms XP, coins, and weapons. The rewards are directly tied to how far into the campaign you've battled, which helps players feel like they've earned those idle rewards and deepens the satisfaction. This is the compelling mechanic that creates those convincing little push notifications that remind you to come back to the game. 
What's great about this is AFK Arena actually rewards you for not playing it, and that's a strong retention mechanic. While other games like Animal Crossing punish you for stepping away for a while with passive aggression, AFK Arena makes you feel good for coming back. I'm analyzing football manager game. I had a couple of days off and, and suddenly some players on my team have left. Like the game moves on without you, uh, without you getting benefits from it. So then here in AFK Arena, I, I suddenly, I was off and I'm rewarded with uh, really good equipment or or stuff like that, and I, I can I can uh, upgrade my favorite hero. It works. The other thing that works? Events. When you first start playing AFK Arena, there are a few daily events you can take part in for newbies. As you progress, more events open up that can reward you with rare heroes. Some are time limited, some aren't, but they're all incredibly creative. Take, for example, the popularity contest. Players voted for eight of their favorite characters and from those results, the most popular were entered into a tournament. The clever thing was that... Developers could get insight on which characters are most liked and they could make similar kind of characters in the future. Lilith Games constantly pumps new, unique content into AFK Arena and events like this make sure that even if you're stuck on a level, there's always something to do. Of course, sometimes this creativity can backfire. Well, one event that went, went wrong, wrong was kind of a uh, player popularity. When the popularity contest was applied to players, the idea was that those who received the most gifts from other players would be rewarded with the best avatar frame. So what happened was... People started scamming others, they were selling nude pictures and, and oh. what so not. So I think that, that was a misstep. Still, just like most RPGs, AFK Arena constantly encourages players to be social by rewarding any time you join a guild or add a friend or share activity on social media. Social events and these sorts of elements are strong retention tools that build communities people genuinely enjoy being part of. AFK Arena takes all the lessons Lilith learned from its other game, Rise of Kingdoms, and adapts them to a turn-based RPG with relatively simple core gameplay and beautiful graphics. With strong character designs, a committed fan base, aggressive monetization, and a satisfying progression loop, there's a lot to admire here. That's it for this episode, but subscribe for more insights from the Game Refinery analysts, and thanks for watching.